same prerequisite to this sermon that I gave to the nine o'clock. Uh, I don't have any notes. Y'all looking at me kind of funny. Don't, don't be scared because I'm scared. I don't have any notes. God spoke to me, uh, a poignant word, and uh, he told me to speak it from my heart. Is that all right? So uh, y'all give me a couple of amens. We might make it through this today. Y'all got my back? All right. Grab somebody's hand. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you for your presence. Thank you for the anointing that's in this room. I thank you for each person that's part of this church and every visitor, Lord. It's a great place to worship. Thank you, God, for all that you've done for us. Now, Lord, I'm praying today that you speak to our hearts and to our minds and give us the, the ability to see beyond every situation and connect with the purpose and the destiny that you have for our lives. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, come on, clap your hands one more time. Just before you sit down, I know we've done this, but I, I just believe you can't honor leadership enough. Am I right about it? Amen. So can we clap our hands again for our founder, Pastor Randy White. Come on, let's bless the Lord for him. Appreciate him being here today. And let's bless God for the dynamic, anointed, and wonderful, and, you know, I just call her mama. Let's thank God for our overseer, Pastor Paula White. Come on, put your hands together. Let's send love all the way down to Orlando. Can we do that? Amen. And to Pastor Michael, let's bless the Lord for him again. And thank God for Dad, Dad White being with us, and Scott and Doug, and, of course, my wife again. Go on, wave at him one more time, baby. Amen. And thank God for Brandon being with us today, looking like a preacher. Got his suit on. Amen. Just had a baby. Was drinking an a, a, a energy drink this morning. I understand. I got three of them. Amen. Now clap your hands at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, thank God for you. Oh, we couldn't have church without you. I appreciate you, and I'm excited about your future. Amen. While you're standing, Romans chapter 12, I want to read verse 1 and 2. And I'm not going to be before you long, so I want you to get your spiritual ear open today. I want to speak a word to you. Now, we're going to be teaching a series on the Holy Spirit. So this whole month, we're going to deal with the Holy Spirit, and we're going to deal with Pentecost. It's all going to culminate on the last Sunday of this month, month which is Pentecost. And uh, I'm going to be teaching on, I mean, we're going to get real practical. I'm going to deal with what the baptism of the Holy Ghost is. I'm going to deal with the evidence that you have it, which is speaking in tongues. I'm going to deal with spiritual gifts, motivational gifts. I'm going to deal with the fruit of the Spirit. And for some of us, we've been around Pentecostalism for a long time. But how many of you know you need a refresher course? Sometimes your gifts get dormant. Amen. You got to stir up the gift. Tell somebody, stir up the gift. But there's others among us. I believe this month we're going to have people filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues like never before. How many know a church flowing in the Spirit is a powerful church? Amen. Tell somebody, you need the Holy Ghost. Amen. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I'm going to begin today, and we're just going to kind of break the ice on this series, and we're going to deal with some things that will help us along this month. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Watch this. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I want to leave the thought with you this morning, living in your future. Will y'all help me preach and just tell somebody you got to live in your future. Amen. You may have your seats in the presence of the Lord. You know, there's been many things said about spiritual people. And as we going to this month of teaching on the Holy Ghost, you're going to hear a lot of terms like the anointing and people who are anointed and how you are anointed with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You're anointed to do certain things. You're anointed in your gifting. But I think many times we have the wrong concept of what a spiritual person is. Many times we think that spiritual people are people who don't make mistakes. We think that spiritual people are those people who lay on the altar for eight hours every day and pray. I told them this morning, 
that I've met some people who pray for eight hours and they're sick, broke, depressed, and struggling in life. And there's a reason for that. I am an intercessor and I learned something early on. You have to know how to deal with your own problems before you can engage the enemy on behalf of somebody else's problem. Because when you become an intercessor, you deal with the weight. Sometimes my wife will want to go somewhere or do something, and I'll say, you know, I just can't go. And she understands, and I go into my prayer time, and I spend time in prayer because I'm feeling the burden of somebody else. Are y'all catching what I'm saying? But I have to also be able to manage my own problems because there are a lot of people that can pray your blessing through. They can pray your healing through. They can pray your job through, but they can't pray for themselves. So you got to learn how to deal with yourself when you become an intercessor. And so sometimes we get this almost iconic view of what we think spiritual people are. You know, people that speak in tongues every three minutes. People are, who are deep all the time and always have a revelation. You know, it's funny. When you ask certain deep people, you'll say, how you doing today? They got this whole spill. You know, I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, blessed of the Lord, living a life of salvation. Okay, that's all good, but I just want to know if you're all right. Uh, I'm doing good. It'd be pretty good right through here. Somebody say amen. So it's not always what we project, the image of spirituality that constitutes what a spiritual person is. When we think of spiritual people from a biblical perspective, names like Moses come to mind. Names like Abraham come to mind. I mean, look at Abraham. Abraham was so spiritual that he was living in a prosperous area. And God spoke to him and told him to go to a land that he had never been. The Bible literally says that he started walking and he didn't know where he was going. Now, you can't get any more spiritual than that to hear a word from God and start walking and not even know if you got... Look, he didn't have a GPS. He didn't have a map. Come on, somebody. He didn't have Google search. He just went to walking. Why? Because he had heard a word from the Lord. And I come to tell you today that when God is really speaking to you, he doesn't tell you how you're going to get there. He doesn't always share the things you got to go through. How many of you know if God would have told you all you had to go through to get where you are today, you might have done something else? But faith says God has given me a word. And no matter what I got to go through, I'm going to get up from where I am and I'm going to start walking toward the vision. He had this kind of faith. Moses was known as the greatest prophet of the Old Testament. Moses was so powerful, he was raised by Pharaoh. He was a king's kid by adoption. He was the leader of the Israelite nation out of bondage in Egypt. You think about men like David. David, who was one of the greatest kings and leaders and warriors that the kingdom had ever had. He was so anointed, he knew how to deal with a Saul the right way. He was so anointed, he understood the power of praise and worship as it relates to God. All of these men we would call spiritual. But the truth is, Abraham was a liar. Why are y'all looking at me so funny? He told a king that this woman is not my wife and not my sister. She's my wife. It was a half truth because it was his stepsister. I mean, his half sister, but a half truth is a whole lie. Moses was a murderer. Uh huh. Yeah, the greatest prophet in the world killed an Egyptian. He was also a coward because he ran to the backside of the desert. How many know you can't run from your problems? Real champions face problems. Can I talk to y'all? Touch them. I say, stop running. Stop running. Just face that person. Face that problem. Face that struggle because you ain't going to be able to sleep at night until you get it taken care of. That was for somebody prophetically. Watch this. Do I even have to talk about David's proclivities? David was a whoremonger. He liked women. You know how they knew David was dead or about to die? They took a young virgin and put him in the put her in the bed with him. And when he didn't respond to her, they said, oh, the king is dead. <laughs> he was a murderer. He killed Uriah, put him at the heat of the battle. He was an adulterer. He stole his wife. Can I talk to y'all? David had some problems, but God said he's a man after my own heart. 
So I'm not advocating sin. I'm not saying that you can't live a holy life. In fact, real visionaries understand I may have some problems. I may have some situations, but I'm going to take my messed up self. I'm going to take all my problems and my proclivities and I'm going to lay them down before God. And I may not have it all together yet, but God has given me a vision in my future. And you may want to hold me to what I've done in the past, but I see something greater than where I've been. I wish I had some people in here that got a dream and are ready to wake the giant up on the inside. I wish I had some people that are not going to let what you've been through, not going to let what people say stop you from being the man or the woman of God he's called you to be grab somebody and tell them say I'm living in my future watch this I don't want to spend much time on this first verse but I I do need to touch it for clarity's sake but I really want to focus on the second and I'm not going to be long so I need a few more amens y'all must want me to preach a long time then okay this book of Romans is interesting because it is called the Magna Carta of the gospel It is known to be the gospel according to Paul. This is a book that really gives us the rudimentary basics of what being a Christian is all about. It is so powerful and so poignant that most theologians will agree to truly understand the gospel, you have to read the book of Romans. And it's interesting because when Paul wrote this book, he wasn't in Rome. He had never been to Rome. He was desiring to go. So he lays out to the Roman church and all the believers there, he lays out the pattern of how to live for Christ. And when we get to this 12th chapter, it's literally called the chapter of practical application. How many of you know that it doesn't do it? You know, we had this colloquialism, this saying for so long where we said knowledge is power. I want to tell you that's a lie. You got doctors laying in the gutter right now with no job. Come on, because you can know every book in the world and have more degrees than a thermometer and not be able to manage your life. So knowledge is not power. It's the ability to take what you know and put it into action. So applied knowledge is power. So this is where we get into practical application. Now the scripture says here in this first verse, Uh, And I won't take long with this particular part, but he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. This word reasonable is a Greek word. It means logical. So truthfully speaking, if you've been saved and you've given your life to Christ, it's logical that your lifestyle, your mind, your body, your spirit should all be submitted to God. Am I right? Jesus said, you have to love me with all my, all your heart, your soul, and your body. So your totality of who you are has to gravitate toward who he is. Now, the scripture says to offer your body as a living sacrifice. Now, this is interesting because whenever uh, the Hebrews and the Jewish nation would offer sacrifice, they would use a particular altar. On this altar, there were four projections known as horns. Now, we know there's a common story in the original or in the Old Testament. It teaches us that this was also a place of safety, which means if you did something wrong, you could run into the temple, grab the horns of the altar, and nobody could touch you. Now, how does this translate into into today's church? You have to understand that the, the altar is a place of safety. Which means that no matter what I'm going through, no matter what I've been through, when I can get in contact with God on the altar, when I can get in contact with God's spirit, whatever I've been through has to back off of me. But watch this. We're going to get there. Watch this. But these four projections were for something greater. It was for practical everyday purposes. And that was whenever you put a live animal on top of a box, it's not particularly happy about being killed. Which means that it had to be tied to the projections. The horns of the altar were used to tie down the animal. Because its natural inclination is to run. And what you have to understand is, your flesh doesn't want to submit to God. The Bible says no good thing dwells in the flesh. Jesus said the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. 
which means I have to bring my body under subjection. I have to forcefully make my flesh act right. Which means that I have to have the ability to tell myself, I know you don't want to be sacrificed. Let, let me put it like this. How many of y'all ever seen that, those movies? There's about a hundred of them, Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th, they would kill Jason in every movie. Until it was time for the sequel. Because every time you killed him, he always had an uncanny ability to get resurrected. And your flesh is like Jason. Every time you think you got it under subjection, it starts raising its ugly head again. Just when you think you got your mouth under control and you go three weeks without talking crazy to somebody, you mess around and go off on one person and blow everything you've been working on. Just when you think you got morning traffic down and you're not going to get upset when people cut you off and don't use their blinker, amen, and don't know how to drive, amen, and tourists don't know how to drive. I learned that one real quick. Just when you think you got it all together, you've had two good weeks and you ain't cussed at all. Somebody cuts you off the wrong way, gives you an international sign to let you know where you can go, and all of a sudden you're angry again. Can I talk to y'all? You got to understand that every day you have to put your life, you have to put your flesh, you have to put your struggles, you have to put your past on that altar and say, I'm not getting up out of this place of prayer until I bring this thing under subjection. I'm tired of being defeated. I'm tired of 2011 problems showing up in my new year. And I'm not getting out of this place of prayer until I get you under subjection. The second verse then, he says, and be not conformed to this world. Now, I come from, born and raised Baptist, but I, most of my ministry was in Pentecostal holiness. So we learned, man, holiness was like, if you got up in our church and preached a message on holiness, you're going to wreck the house. Grab your neighbor and say, neighbor, you got to be holy. Ooh, I know that's right. And half of them in there wasn't even close to being holy. <laughs> but holiness was a staple. It was a, a ministry. There was a season where we, we pushed that real hard. And we need to keep pushing holiness. Because you got to understand, you may not be perfect, but it's not an excuse. Can I talk to y'all? It's not an excuse to do sin. you got to strive to live a holy life. But, but when I read this verse, it's interesting because in my Pentecostal holiness mindset... This verse says to me something that I think we'll all agree on. In fact, I called my wife. I was out of town when I read this, and I said, what does it mean whenever I say be not conformed to this world? What does it mean to you? At first, she thought I was trying to trick her. So she tried to get all deep, you know, from a grammatical, spiritual perspective of the Greek lexicon. I said, no, 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 no. Seriously, what's the first thing? I'm not trying to trick you. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you read this? She said, don't be like the world. Don't operate in the world system. I was in the car with a driver the other day, and I asked him the same question. I was practicing my message on him. Hope I'm doing pretty good. He was a good practice dummy, I guess. But I asked him, I said, what do you think? He said, don't be like the world. I said, now, in my mind, I said, that's exactly what I think when I read this. So I started looking at this because I just felt like there was something there. This word conform means to be fashion-like. So we've been trained that it means don't be fashioned like the world. Now understand this. I'm not advocating being worldly. But sometimes we've become so strange in church that we can't connect to other people. We got our own songs. We got our own. Look, here's what's funny. In church today, different churches got different ways. So we sing different songs, we worship different ways. We have, so we're all separated and divided all the time. And the world is looking at us like, there are some weird people, they can't even get together. So we have to be able to understand the world system, but not be tainted by it. But this verse is not talking about holiness. He dealt with that in verse 1. What this verse is saying, this word world is the Greek word aeon. This word literally means a period of time. Which means Paul is saying, not to be conformed to the world system in this verse, but what he's really saying is, don't be conformed to where you are right now. 
Oh, y'all caught it. The reason why I can live in my future is because I'm not conformed to my current situation. The reason why people have a difficult time reaching their destiny is because they are so caught up in where they are. They are so conformed to what life is giving them where they are, they can't see anything past their current situation. Oh, man, okay. I'm going to tell y'all a little story. I'm going to tell it early. Maybe it'll help my message. Yesterday, I was getting on a plane, and, uh, you know, they allow uh, those that need assistance to get on first, the elderly and children and so on and so forth. So when I got ready to get on the plane... Uh, I was sitting in the window. I like to fly in the window. And there was an older lady sitting in the aisle. And so I came to her. She had already pulled her lunch out and had her tray open. I'm thinking, man, she must really think she's the only person on this plane. So I came to her and I said, excuse me, ma'am. I'm, you know, I, very kindly, I said, I'm, I'm sitting in the seat beside you. Could I get by you? And she said, well, honey, you know, I, I'm a little older and I don't move that well. So she pulled her tray back. She said, could you step over me? I said, yes, ma'am, I think I can do that. And I just kind of joked with her a little bit, and I said, hopefully I won't mess up and sit in your lap. And she looked at me, and she said, well, every situation has its benefits. <laughs> okay, you got me. Huh? I started cracking up laughing. I mean, but you got to understand that every situation you find yourself in, you have to find the benefit. You have to find what is God trying to teach me here? Do you know, we go through complaining. We go through life complaining about our situation when the truth is God never designed for you to stay there as long as you did. He was trying to teach you something to prepare you for the next level. Can I talk to somebody in here? You've got to look at your situation right now. You may be in a bad marriage situation. You may, your kids may be doing stuff that you don't approve of. Your family may be going to the left. Your money may be bad. Your job may be in jeopardy. But I come to prophesy to you today and let you know that God has a nugget in your situation. And God's about to bless you right where you are. And if you can praise him right through here... If if you can celebrate right through here, no matter how bad it looks, no matter what you're going through, God has a breakthrough in your pain. So, be not conformed to this time period. You got to understand, timing is important. It's a continuum. So what happens is, we try to take one part of the cycle and judge our entire life by it. Most people live in the past. It's just the truth. That's why Bishop, Bishop, uh, 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 Bishop Jakes had to write a book called Let It Go. Because we live in the past. Past connections, past people, past problems, past hurts, past pains. And let me tell you something about people. When you're staying up at night and cussing them out in your mind, I done said cussing twice. Y'all get delivered from cussing in Jesus' name. All right. When you're in your mind upset with somebody else, can I talk to y'all? And you're turning this situation through your mind. Do you know the person you're thinking about is sleeping like a baby? The devil's using that to run it through your mind. What you have to do is you got to learn how to release it. You got to learn how to forgive people. Sometimes you can't even figure out people. So you just love on them and keep it moving. Tell somebody to keep it moving. But we try to judge our life off of time periods. Let me tell you something. You can't go back to the past. So why are you so consumed with it? Your past is talking so loud, it's trying to talk you out of your future. You can't even see where you're going because your past is telling you where you've been. I know I'm talking in here right now. So either we live there or we get so caught up in our current situation, we really don't think it can change. But I come to tell you that time is a continuum. Which means, just like everything in life, this too shall pass. And the only reason why it's delayed is because you hadn't learned the lesson yet. But the moment you say, God, tell me what the lesson is, and when you tell me what it is, I'm going to praise my way up out of this thing. Come on, somebody. All right. All right, I'm done. Be not conformed to this time period. Don't let your now keep you from your future. Don't let what you're dealing with in this situation dictate what you're going to become. Listen. Don't let people, okay, I'm going to get to it. Let me, let me go here, let me go. Watch this. He said, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, I'm going to kind of preach this in reverse order. This word renew means to reconstruct. 
which literally means in order for me to really experience a future vision, I'm talking to people who got a dream. Anybody got a dream in here? For me to actually become intimately acquainted with the future that God has for me, I have to be able to conceive in my mind what God has already placed in my spirit. See, God has already revealed it to your spirit. The problem is, can you convince your mind that it's possible? Can you convince yourself that what God spoke to you can really happen in your life? Let me tell you something. Here's how you can gauge whether or not God spoke to you. If you can do it, that wasn't him. If you got the money to do it, that wasn't God. If you got the friends to do it, it wasn't God. If you got people that can push it for you, that wasn't God. It's when you step out on something, you don't have the ability, you don't have the talent, you don't have the education, you don't have all what it's supposed to take to do what you're doing, but you got a word from the Lord. And when you got a word from the Lord, God will give you everything it takes to operate where he's pushing you to. So you have to construct it in your mind. You have to bring your mind under renovation and I'm almost done. What does this mean? I got to go put my mind under construction. Now, one thing about a construction site when they're doing renovations, if you've ever been to a hotel or airport, I like this. They put a sign up that says, please pardon our progress. Which means this looks real ugly right now. But it was outdated when we started. So you may have to deal with some sawdust and some noises and some things that don't look right. And and it may not be put together right right now. We got a plastic so you can't see what we're doing behind the scenes because you don't need to know everything that's going on back here. But when we get done, this place is going to be completely remodeled. Can I talk to y'all? Put your hand on your head and just talk to your mind and say you're under construction. Oh, yeah, it don't look good. The sight don't look right. But tell your neighbor, pardon my, pro- pardon my progress. You don't know I'm going through some things. I'm dealing with the change. I'm dealing with the struggle, but I'm getting better. And while I'm getting better, God is showing me a better future. And I'm getting ready to live not for where I am, but for where I'm going. Now, as I close, he says, be not conformed to this world, uh, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. This word transform is the Greek word metamorpho. It's the same Greek word we get for transfigure. Which means that uh, Jesus' experience on the Mount of Transfiguration is the same experience that has to take place in your mind for you to go where God is calling you to. Because you can't conceive it where you are because your life is not conducive to your dream. You don't have what it takes to do it. So you have to metamorphose. You have to transform it. You have to build it in your mind. This word metamorpho, the connotation, the idea is that what's on the inside will manifest on the outside. Now, this is very imperative for us to catch, and I'm I'm close to closing now, but you got to catch this. I never make excuses for what's going on in my life. I don't make excuses. Thank you for one person that's with me. This is going to get a little tough through here, but I'm going to help you with something. You should never make an excuse for what's showing up in your life. Because the truth is, it's your fault. I know it's tough, but I'm going to tell you why. Your outer world is a direct reflection of your inner world. So what you do spiritually affects what manifests naturally. Y'all catching what I'm saying? So there are principles that we all operate by. God is no respecter of persons. If he blessed Pastor Michael, he can bless me too. If he blessed your neighbor, he can bless you too. He's no respecter. Do y'all believe that? So that's why you should never get mad when somebody else succeeds. They just did what it took on the inside to have a manifestation on the outside. That's called transformation. Can I talk to y'all? Do you want to transform your outer world? Well, start with working on your prayer life. Start with getting scriptures that deal with where you want to go and start getting the word down on the inside. Start rebuilding on the inside what you want to show up on the outside. Y'all don't want me to talk to you. Grab somebody and tell them, say, I'm going through a transformation. All right. There are three T's to transformation as I close. You know I'm closing because I'm turning this off. Three T's. And then there's kind of a fourth on there I'll throw in there. The first thing is, whenever God is calling you to live in the future, 
Whenever God is calling you to a higher level, I've discovered that people who are on your current level don't want to let you go. I need some people that know what it means to go higher. They don't want to let you go. They like you hanging out with them. They like you thinking the way they think. They like you. They like having control over you. Amen. They don't want to let you go. But the problem is the people on the next level don't want to let you in. So I'm caught in between my last level and my next level. Now, this is dangerous because Jesus never preached to the middle. Did you know that? He never addressed the middle class. He preached to the rich and he preached to the poor. Because he never intended you to get stuck in the middle of anything. I'm preaching so good and I ain't getting no amen. He never meant for you to be stuck in the middle. Let's break it down economically and then I'm going to be done in about three minutes. Let's break this down economically. If you're middle class, then you make too much money for government assistance. But you don't make enough money to get the tax breaks of the rich. In fact, you pay more taxes than anybody else to fund the programs for the poor and you work for the rich to make them richer. Tell somebody, say, I'm tired of being stuck in the middle. Oh, not only on my job, not only in my money, but I'm tired of being in the middle of everything I'm in right now. I'm ready to elevate. So, how many of y'all are tired of being in the middle? So when you get tired of being in the middle, you'll look at the people on your last level and say, I'm sorry, but I got to get out of here. And you'll tell the people on the next level, you better let me in. I'm coming in whether you're going to let me in or not. I'm going to kick the door open if you won't let me. I'll pick the lock in the spirit if I have to because I got to go higher than where I am. So the first part of transformation is you have to trespass in your next level. That's good to me, y'all. You got to trespass in the next level, which means I have to have the ability to go somewhere that people think I don't belong. I don't look like my next level. I'm dressed like the last level. I don't talk like my next level. I'm still talking like the last level. So when I show up and trespass, they say, you don't belong here. You don't look right. You don't smell right. You don't dress right. You don't talk right. You need to go back to your last level. Most people say, okay, and guess what? Everybody on your last level has got their arms open saying, oh, we'll welcome you back. Come on, we missed you. Can I talk to y'all? That's why you got to shut the door on your past. You got to close off, cut off all safety nets, kick out all the crutches. There is no going back. So while you're trespassing, they're trying to talk you out of that level. So what you have to do next is you have to transcend. Three T's. Trespass, transcend. What does this mean? This means I have to have the ability to rise above everything they're saying. Because if I don't rise above it, I'll let them talk me out of my future. Grab somebody and say, don't let the devil talk you out of your future. Don't let people talk you out of your future. Don't let haters talk you out of your future. Don't let people who could care less about your future talk you out of your future. Then, after you transcend and I'm done, the next level is trespass, transcend, then you have to transform. This is where I've been at this level long enough and now I done bought me some new clothes so I look like I fit in. I learned how you talk, so now I can articulate the way you articulate on this level. I observed all of the things you do, and I learned everything you know. So now my thing is this. If I know everything you know, and I know everything I know, I know more than you. So now what happens is I take over the level. And now everybody that was trying to push me out of that level has to follow my lead. Oh, y'all look. So then you go from being a trespasser to a trailblazer. I wish I had some people in here that could see your future today that would jump up on your feet and shout, I'm moving from a trespasser to a trailblazer. I'm getting ready to boldly go where no man has gone before. I'm getting ready to walk into a future that people say I can't have. In fact, it looks bad right now, but in my mind, I'm already there. In my mind, I already
already see the break breakthrough. I already see the blessing. I already see the healing. I already see the business. I already see the turnaround. Grab somebody and tell them, say, live in your future. I feel something in here right now. I'm done. Lift your hands. There's a reason why you had to go through what you had to go through. Because anything you have to fight for, you won't let anybody or any demon in hell take it from you. How many of y'all got to fight down in your spirit? I told him this morning, I'm done. I had an old raggedy car my parents gave me. I never changed the oil. Remain standing. I'm done. I never changed the oil. I never put oil in it. I barely put gas in it. Had a seat so raggedy on the right side, it wasn't connected to the floor. If I went on a date, a girl would get in the car and be immediately in the back seat. She'd forget about it. I wouldn't tell her, get back in the car after dinner and do it again. I thought it was funny. But I didn't take care of this car and it had some years on it. It could have lasted for a while, but I didn't take care of it. It blew up. It blew up. But when I had to buy my own car, how many bought that new car and you was looking out the window at night? Couldn't even sleep. Woo can't wait to go to work tomorrow I washed it till the paint fell off of it vacuumed it every day had air fresheners on every part of the car you I mean you get in the trunk and it smells good why because you had to work to pay for what you had God sent me to tell you today he has a great future for you and everything that you're going through he's just trying to put something down on the inside and give you a fight so when the enemy comes against your future you can stand up to him and tell him you can't have my destiny you can't have my future you can't have my children you can't have my money you can't have my family if you believe it shout hallelujah Listen, if you're in here today and you got a sleeping giant and you're ready to wake him up, how many of y'all got a dream that's been under anesthesia? Ah, it's time to take him out of anesthesia and put him in the recovery room because your dream is about to come to life. Ah, you went through so hard over the past two years, you gave up on your dream. But God said today, it's time to come alive again. I want you to run down to this altar as quick as you can. And I want you to lift your hands. I feel a release in this house. I feel his presence, y'all. Wake up that sleeping giant. Wake up that sleeping giant. Whatever God spoke to your spirit, you've got to become so intimately acquainted with it that no matter what shows up in your life, you know that what God said will come to pass. Come on, they're coming. They're coming. My dream is waking up. Come on, tell them to shake the dust off. Wipe your eyes. Get the cold out. Because today, I'm going to live again. How many of y'all ready to live again? That's right, come on. Let's get excited about your future. Tell somebody I'm going somewhere. Now, you don't see it right now because I'm going through some things. I'm under construction, but I'm going somewhere. Pardon my progress. I'm going somewhere. Lift your hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, I speak to that vision. Ooh, y'all, I feel this presence so strong. I speak to that dream. And I thank you, God, that whatever you promised us in the future, it will come to pass. I pray that from this day forward, favor will fall over every person on the sound of my voice. I pray that even this week, uncommon favor, supernatural breakthroughs, people just start calling. God, give us encouragement on our path to live a life full of purpose. God, I don't want anybody on this altar to live below the potential you called them to. Wake up the giant on the inside. Empower them now. And I give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, clap your hands. I see you crying, sweetheart. That giant is waking up. I see you crying. That vision is coming alive. I see you crying. The blessing is on you right now. Now, as you leave this altar, just high five everybody you see and tell them I'm living in my future. I'm living in my future. I'm living in my future. I'm living. Come on. Come on, as you leave this altar, high five somebody and tell them I'm living in my future. I'm living, I'm living. Hallelujah. Now everybody else lift your hands. I decree and declare today that God.